And uh, so I want to begin this morning by taking you uh, to a kind of an introductory reading, all right, to the subject that I want to address, uh, to the things in which I want to talk about. And it has to do with the voices of the prophets, all right? So I'm taking the phrase out from the book of Acts. It's called, and Paul was the one who used that phrase, the voices of the prophets. So we're going to read it in context as to what Paul was referring to. And I want you to uh, uh, hear this. And uh, the Lord give to us at such a time critical in our times and our days that we're living in and to understand the voices of the prophets. And by this, I do not mean prophets that so many men and women today are traveling with, are traveling with or thriving with uh, in uh, the church of our time. I'm talking about the prophets in Scripture, the prophets of the Old Testament, the prophet of even the New Testament, the voices of the prophets, and uh, where the church is, and the ability and the discerning eye or the discerning heart of the church in hearing the voices of the prophets is one of the hallmark of the health and the strength of the church of Jesus Christ. All right. So the ability, the discerning heart, and the discerning year of the church to hear the voices of the prophet is a indication and it is an index uh, to measure or to tell the health and the state of the church of Jesus Christ. And there, sadly today, uh, we have not had... I think, by and large, uh, in in so many ways, the Church of Jesus Christ and the nations of the earth have lost the ability to hear the voices of the prophet. And uh, and as we go along and as we read, uh, you find it out for yourself. And not being able to hear and discern the voices of the prophet is a dangerous thing for the church. And uh, we will not be able to know where we are. We will never be able to know the powers, the life, the power, and uh, the place of where the church is. And this is where the failure is of our modern times, that we have lost the ability to hear the voices of the prophets. And, uh, and in so doing, I would even say today that that would also eliminate and... Uh, paralyzed today the church, our modern church of our time, to be able to hear a word that is prophetic in nature. What if there was a word that was so prophetically pronounced that needed our attention, that needed not just our attention, all of our attention needed, you know, the fullness of all of our uh of our commitment to whatever the Lord is speaking to us. And if we have lost that ability to hear the word of the prophets or a prophetic word, then uh, we essentially has missed what God is speaking to us. And I think that the church has suffered through the ages that uh, every now and again, when a prophetic word uh, has been issued to the church of Jesus Christ. The church has been found wanting. We do not have the ability. We don't have the discerning heart or the mind uh, to understand what the voice and the voices of the prophets were. So here is a term used by the apostle. The reading here is here uh, in Acts is in the in the 13th chapter. Reading in chapter 13 of the Acts of the Apostle, 
This is the account of the first missionary journey of Paul. Paul spent three missionary journey in his lifetime, and uh, and that was the conclusion of his work on the earth. So beginning here in chapter 13 of the Acts of the Apostle is the account of his first missionary journey. Now understand that he has been in Antioch for almost about 12, 14 years. All right? And uh, doing virtually nothing, as in traveling or minist ministering and uh, planting churches all over uh, Asia Minor. It hasn't begun for a long time. He has just been with the church in Antioch together with Barnabas. So after a long wait of almost close to, you know, a dozen more years, and here the account given to us in chapter 13 was that in a prayer meeting, it happened, and the Lord spoke, not to both of them, not to even Paul and Barnabas. Can you imagine? They were sent, not because they were spoken to go. They were sent because God spoke to others in the church that it is time for them to go. How about that? And uh, that's humility, isn't it? That is truly uh, what should be happening in the church. And so many men and women today have gone. The Lord spoke to me. I went. The Lord told me to do this. They went. And, uh, and so, you know, that becomes you know, the basis. But scripturally, this is found here in Acts chapter 13, that Paul and Barnabas, they were, they were apostles of the church. And the scriptures say that God spoke to others that it is time now to separate Paul and Barnabas for the work in which they have been called into. Can you imagine the humility and uh, and how, you know, it tells you the, the condition of the church at that time. It tells you the, the unity. It tells you the trust. It tells you the love and the commitment and the integrity that is shared among the people of God. There's someone just out of the church. And this is, this is not just anyone out of the church. This is the church that has been operation, that have been meeting together, that has been functioning together under the authority of Jesus Christ and the ministry of the word. And uh, out of the obedience of the spirit while they were praying and the Lord spoke to others. In fact, while they were fasting, actually, the scripture says, while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me uh, Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And uh, can you imagine? That, that directive did not come straight to Paul and Barnabas. It came to others, of which was then spoken to them. So the agreement, can you imagine that? And uh, you would be thinking that, you know, when someone said something like that, and Paul and Barnabas would have probably stood up and said, oh, that time is not right. I don't feel it's time for me to go. No such thing happened. And such was the, uh, the, the unity. Such was the unison. Such was the communion. And such was the maturing of that body. So it's a remarkable uh, people, a remarkable church there in Antioch given to us. And there began Paul's first uh, missionary journey. I'm breaking in now. He traveled, and I'm going to read now from verse 13 of this chapter. Now Paul after, and now after Paul and his companions set sail for Patphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, but John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But going on from Perga, they arrive at Bicedian Antioch. Now, Bicedian Antioch, just to let you know, it's somewhere in the central part of, uh, is, in central, is the Asia Minor, modern Turkey as usual. But just to give you a kind of a brief idea, because you don't think of Bicedian Antioch, they were all under the rule of the Roman Empire at that time. Bicedian, Bicedian Antioch. It's not too far from the church of Laodicea. So you know Laodicea far more. So they are just a short traveling distance between Laodicea is by Sidon and Antioch. So that, that was where uh, they found themselves. So they arrived there at Pisidian and Antioch. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. So even there in Pisidian and Antioch, uh, they were synagogues. They were 
known as the di diaspora of Jews. So they have built synagogues and they were worshiping Yahweh uh, there. And Paul and Barnabas and the team found themselves in that place and went into the synagogue on Sabbath day. Verse 15, and after the reading of the law and the prophets, the synagogue officials sent to them saying, brothers, you have any word of exaltation for the people, say it. So Paul stood up and motioning with his hands and said, men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people, so in so virtually this is his first, not only his first missionary journey, his first missionary message, his first message ever preached outside of Antioch. All right? And uh, so he says that the God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and lifted up the people during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with an uplifted arm, he led them out from it. And for a period of 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. And when he destroyed seven nations in the land of Cana, he distributed land or their land as an inheritance, all of which took about 450 years. In other words, this is how long it took for God to do this for his people. After these things, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And after he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, about whom he also said, bearing witness, I have found David and the son of Jesse, a man after my heart who will do all my will. From the seed of this man, according to promise, God brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus. After John had preached before his coming, a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was fulfilling his course, he kept saying, what do, you, what do you suppose that I am? I'm not he, but behold, one is coming after me of whom I'm not worthy to untie the sandals of his feet. Brothers, verse 26, sons of Abraham's family and those among you who fear God, and to us the word of this salvation was sent. For those who live in Jerusalem and the rulers, recognizing neither him. So Paul is now bringing this message to such a crucial point in the whole revelation of the person of Jesus Christ to Israel. And there he was in Jerusalem amongst you for so long, coming to you. And yet our people in Jerusalem, Sabbath after Sabbath, gathering there in the synagogue. That's what he was trying to say here. Those who live in Jerusalem and all of these rulers, recognizing neither him nor the utterances of the prophets. The original word here is the voices of the prophets. Recognizing neither him nor the utterances or the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfill them by condemning him. And though they found no ground for death, they asked Pilate that he be executed. And when they had finished all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem and everyone, and the very ones who are now his witnesses to the people. And we proclaim to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers. And then the message continues on here. So you recognize my, uh, my intention is to direct you back into verse 27 here. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, recognizing neither him nor the voices of the prophets, 
which are read every Sabbath, fulfill them by condemning him. So in other words, they, can, they didn't recognize Jesus. He who walked amongst them for 33 years, and those at the very center of that capital in Jerusalem, Sabbath after Sabbath, these rulers who were there, and what were they doing Sabbath after Sabbath? Number one, they could not recognize the Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God in whom the Father have sent. Neither, he says, neither did they recognize even the voices of the prophets of which they were reading Sabbath after Sabbath. Now, what is so interesting that I want to highlight to you is this, that Paul put a correlation between the two. The correlation is that they were so blind that they could not recognize the very Savior make manifest in front of them. And the correlationship is that that which they miss as the Savior of Israel and the Savior of the world, at the same token, they also miss Sabbath after Sabbath hearing the voices of the prophets. So in Paul's understanding and in Paul's mind, he put this two together. It's remarkable here and actually frightening. So I want to build this or I want to kind of uh, deal with this together with you, this subject of the voices of the prophet. So they not understanding what they read Sabbath after Sabbath, reading the prophets. You know? In other words, they were reading Jeremiah. They were reading Isaiah. They were reading Amos. They were reading Habakkuk. They were reading Ezekiel. They were reading all of these prophets of old in the Sabbath in their Sabbath, in their synagogue, Sabbath after Sabbath, and none of them have ever heard of the voices of the prophet, meaning none of the messages of which they were reading from had any meaning to them. In other words, they were opening the, the scriptures and hearing this from their rulers and from their priests. And all of these words that were pronounced by the prophet so long ago, and all of the prophets were pointing to the coming of the Messiah. All of the prophets were dealing with the whole idea of the salvation of Israel through a person, and which is the promised son. All of the prophets were dealing with all of the history of the judgment of Israel in the past. All of those lessons that were learned, all of those things of which their forefathers fell, backslid, and came under judgment, and they were all dispersed, and they came under the hands of the uh, uh, the uh, their possessor or their, cap their captors, well, they were invaded and they were dispersed and they were displaced, you know, in foreign countries. All of those are found in the prophets. So how can you not, when you read this or when you read the message of the prophet, that, that Israel, that Jews in the synagogue, Jews and children of Israel in Israel were hearing this, why is it that they caught no, none of these messages? None of these warnings, none of these predictions, and none of these uh, prophetic fulfillment. And Jesus was right there in front of them, make manifest in front of them. So Paul put the two, uh, these two pieces together. The very Christ which was in your presence that you did not recognize. The very Jesus that was made manifest to you that you have no knowledge that you could not recognize that you in the end not only did not recognize but in the end you put him to death by your own hands as you read further what Paul was preaching from. And then at the same token, Paul says that this is the reason. Now for you not having to recognize the Messiah is the very reason. It's, it's, it's in itself the proof that while you're reading the prophets, you were blind to it. So in other words, you were blind to the Savior. You were blind to all of the prophets you're reading to. You did not recognize the presence of the Savior. So in the same token, neither are you recognizing what you're reading. You read it. You go to the synagogue. You open those books. You read those prophetic literature. But it has got no meaning to you. In other words, the voices of the prophet has, is, is, is far from you. 
He hasn't, have, he hasn't done anything to you. He hasn't spoken to you. These messages do not register anything inside you. So the correlation between rejecting one and then the other is in the same basket. And Paul put it together. Now it's very interesting because in order to build the significance for what I'm about to say, I want to kind of take and extract uh, something which I have not considered for, I don't know, perhaps for a long time. It has to do with the voices of the prophets. What's that? What is it that Jews who go into the synagogue Sunday after Sabbath, Sabbath after Sabbath, and yet do not even recognize what they're hearing? I'm now thinking sometimes in our modern times in the, in the, in the church of our days and so many who give themselves to the hearing of the word. Long season, long years of hearing the preaching of the word from pastors and teachers and, 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 and servants of the Lord in meetings, in churches. Sometimes you wonder, of all the years, the long duration of ourselves given to the ministry of the word, has it done anything? Have we actually hear what God is trying to say? Have we actually got the message? Have we actually got the essence of what has been preached or have been declared? So here is Paul putting this two in conjunction, the rejecting or the blindness to the Savior and the deafness to the hearing of the voices of the prophet. Now, he uses the word, the voices of the prophets. Now, you have to understand that at the time when these Jews were listening to the prophets, it's not, it wasn't the voices of the prophet, actually. It's what the prophet have wrote. The, because the actual prophets the, that were that wrote those uh, scriptures, they're not there anymore. Isaiah is not with them. Jeremiah is long gone. You know, centuries ago, Amos and Habakkuk and Malachi, all of them is no longer amongst them. And yet Paul chooses to use that phrase, the voices of the prophets. It's because there is a reason why Paul employed that word here, the voices of the prophet. Now, in order to build on this, I need to take you to none other than the prophet Jeremiah. And I want to show to you what really is in that voice of a prophet. What's, what's, what's the difference between any other man's voice, my voice, your voice, and all of our voices? But what is so significant about the voices of the prophets Let's do this together, shall we? Now, why do I choose Jeremiah? And uh, the reason is because no other prophets in the Old Testament stands out in a way uh, in so many aspects that is as close a counterpart to Jesus Christ himself. Remember I said that? that uh, of all of the prophets of the Old Testament, Jeremiah is, is reckoned to be the closest of the counterpart of the spirit of Jesus Christ. And that's why I chose this particular person here. Now, I want to kind of like skip and kind of move around in the prophecies or in the writings of Jeremiah. So if you're in Jeremiah, I'm taking you to the first chapter. And uh, here in verse 9 and 10, I want you to take note that uh, this is the initial call of Jeremiah. You may remember there was a tussle. There was a back and forth uh, response between, between Jeremiah and the call of God, between God who calls him and how he found himself and answering and says, I do not know how to speak. I'm a youth and so on and so forth. And yet the Lord said, I'm going to set you and then all that I have commanded to you, you're going to speak. Reading now in verse nine. And then Yahweh sent, forth his hand and touched my mouth and Yahweh said to me behold I put my words in your mouth now I want you to I want you to kind of look at that one more time he said behold I put my words in your mouth now he acknowledged right at the very beginning that I'm not a person that know how to speak now I don't know we have no historical account about uh, the initial stage 
or what Jeremiah was, you know, in his articulation, in his speaking. You know, some people, when they speak, they don't speak very clearly. Uh, they have uh, murmurings. They have, uh, uh, what, shudderings, you know, and their words are not clear. Sometimes their tongues are short, so that makes pronunciation difficult. You know, all kinds of things that you can have these defects and impediments and you want to have as you're growing up as a person. Maybe Jeremiah came in one of those, come under one of those categories that makes him feel, what, I'm a prophet? You want to call me to serve as a prophet? See, I, I can't speak. I don't know how to speak. Or maybe he is not clever with words. Maybe he's slow. Maybe mentally, you know, it's it hard for him to find expression of the things he wants to say. It's in his head. But to come out with words is difficult. You know, you have this once in a while. All right. You have so much to say. But by the time you want to say it, you don't know how to say it. You know, things like that. Things kind of get, kind of, you know, got gets jammed up in your head. So it could be any of these uh, reasons as to why Jeremiah responded in that way. So it's unusual. It's 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 unusual as in that that God knows this. In other words, when God called him, he knew at the very beginning the state that Jeremiah is, the person that he is, and and what is inherently within him. God knows that. So this is so purposeful here in verse nine that says, "That behold, God said, I'll put my words in your mouth." So it's not about you having all of your devices and all of your cleverness and bringing out vocabularies and words and string them all in sentences and then proclaim it. That's got nothing to do with it. I'm going to put my word into your mouth. And so specific it was. I'll put my word into your mouth and I have appointed you this day over the nations and over the kingdom to uproot, to tear down, to cause the parish, to pull down, to build and to plant. Now, this is it. Now, Jeremiah never knew the extent of what that means when God said, I'll put my word into your mouth. What Jeremiah was to discover for the next many, many years, many, many decades, the cost, the price, the agony, the anguish, the power of what happens when God put his word, not only just to a man's mouth. Now, he, he has to use the mouth as the beginning for Jeremiah because that, ex, that is exactly the function of the prophet. The function of the prophet is oracular in nature. In other words, they're responsible for proclamation. So what he did not know is that what, Paul, what God said is, I'm going to put words in your mouth. But what he did not know is it doesn't begin in the mouth. Eventually, it will come out of your mouth. But when I put words into you, it is beyond your mouth. He didn't know that. God didn't explain that to him at the beginning. But later as we read the prophecies, as we read the writings of, the, of Jeremiah, the detail that he gave, what happened to those words, the words that he was to proclaim. So it's not as simple as you think that, that, that he virtually said to Jeremiah. He said, Jeremiah, not to worry. When the time comes, just stand up, stand there, wait. I'm going to just put words in your mouth and then, you know, it's like turning on the switch and then suddenly you're going to come out with words. You know, you keep on uttering words out of your mouth. It's not like this. It's, it's not that kind of a, of a declaration in which a man's mind, in, in this case, Jeremiah's mind and heart and soul and all that is inside him is devoid of any connection with the word. It will be easy for God to kind of like use the, the tongue of a man, you know, like a typewriter and flip all those words out and type all the words and he declared, it will be easy. But Jeremiah was to learn that that was not to be the process. That was not to be how it's going to function. That this word that's going to come out, that I'm going to put in your mouth, is going to begin in a whole different measure, in a whole different organic, in a whole different dynamic a uh, uh, function that you have never known before. That this is going to be an experience. It's, in fact, it's not only experience, it's a phenomenon. So Jeremiah, they know that. Now, how would God explain things like this to Jeremiah at the heyday of his call? Of course he could not. <clears throat> so time has to be given <clears throat> for understanding to develop in the prophet. He was only a young man, by the way. You should know that he lasted his prophetic ministry, carried him into 40, 50 years. That's a long time. So he kind of took a journey, and God took him to a journey, and this is how it all began. So now because of time, what I'm going to do is 
I'm going to spot read with you. So come with me now. Uh, so for all the time that was to come, Jeremiah was to receive those words. So let me give you an example in chapter 4, by the way. Now chapter 4, if you begin in chapter 4, it's the part of the of the revelation to Jeremiah concerning the evil that is from the north. The evil from the north is actually the Assyrian Empire that's going to come down from the north to invade Israel and even finally Judah. So it was a frightening thing because it was vivid. Because when God revealed this to the prophets, usually they're all very vivid. How the attack is going to come and in what fashion they're going to come, and what are the consequences that will follow. So that's given to us here in chapter 4, but I want to break here in verse 8. So just look at verse 8, and this is now, now once in a while in the reading of the prophets, pay attention to when the prophet break out, out of the whole charade of all of the prophecies, and the judgment, and the desolation, and the pronouncement of all of, uh, the, 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 the destruction that will come once in a while, you'll find the prophet breaking out of that mode and begin to talk about themselves. Because see what happened is that these prophets are human too. They have feelings. All right? They have emotions. They have hearts. They have thoughts. Understand this. They, have, they, they, they consist all of the makeup of a human being. They can be disappointed. They can be sad. They can be sorrowful. They can be in anguish. They can be in fear. They can even be in trembling. They can be even in disappointment. These prophets are not Superman. Got the point? All right. These prophets are not Superman. They are, they are men of the earth. They are men of light passions. They are men like anyone that God picked up. So God never devoid the calling and take that away from a man. So God never took that out of the prophets. They never took that out of Jeremiah. So he allowed Jeremiah sometime to stop in the whole prophetic utterances. And can you imagine by the time he's done seeing, and prophets basically not only, uh, uh, they not only speak, but they also see. That's why sometimes prophets are known as seer. So they see. So most of these prophecies, I suppose, uh, could have come from visions. So they would have vivid visions of the future, like what we see in, uh, you know, in the book of the Revelation when John was the island of Patmos. So let's say if they saw this, I mean, it's frightening, all right? The 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 calamities, the desolation, and all of the death and all of the destruction that will come to cities after cities and then inhabitants and and sons and daughters and fathers and mothers. So you can imagine when that, let's say that that stops, you know, and for a moment that vision stops. Can you imagine the anguish, the, the emotions and all that is involved within themselves? And this is a classic example in verse 8 of chapter 4. For this, I girt myself with sackcloth, lament and veil for the burning anger of Yahweh has not turned back from us. See that now? So this is not just about looking Oh, okay. Oh, go, God, this is what you're going to do. All right. All right. I'm going to write it lower down. I'm going to tell your people. Okay. All right. Yes, God. Yes. Okay. This is what you're going to do. This is what these guys from the north is coming to do. Okay. All right. Very good. All right. I'm, I, I'll get all this thing down and, and, and tell them. You know, it's not like this. You notice that by the time when it is true, this is what happens. He said, I get myself with sackcloth. I lament and I will. Why would he do that? Because... Because something went inside. Got the point now? That when he received this word, remember, initially God said, I'm going to put this word in your mouth. He now realized that for this word to come out from his mouth, this word has to begin to do something. This word is going far beyond my tongue, far beyond my mouth. This is going inside. This is going into my inward part. This is coming into you know, the area of my inward domain. This is in my emotion. This is in my heart. This is in my soul. This is in my thought. It affected him as a man. 
So the prophets were not allowed to just become, you know, oracles and they were loudspeaker. Got the point there? They were not just instrument of proclamation as in, in some mechanical way that they were made to feel the very word in which they were about to proclaim. They were made to carry the anguish. They were made to feel even the anger. Can you imagine that a man who would feel the anger of God? I'm looking at this young grandson of mine that when I get angry with him, he knows it. And for almost about five, ten minutes, he'll do everything he can in order to get my favor again. He'll get closer, he'll push me and touch me and get his bum and lean against me, you know, just to get my favor again. He's made to feel that I'm upset with him. I'm talking about a human relationship here. And this is divine. This is the calling of a prophet. This is the destiny of a nation and of a people. So here you are. The classic example is that when Jeremiah saw this, when he received the word, saw what was coming through the word of the future of Israel, this is what happened. He says, that I got myself with sackcloth, I lament and veil. He didn't just cry, he veiled. He, he then understood that having God to put words in my mouth is more than just telling me the things to say. I'm now beginning to realize that I'm not just to say of those things. I'm not just to, to, to make mention of those things. I'm first of all to carry those things. I'm to feel that thing. I'm to experience that thing. I'm going to bear the anguish of that thing. I'm going to bear the heart of that thing. I'm going to bear even the very wrath of that thing. That's why he says that, he says that for the burning anger of Yahweh has not turned back from us. So can you imagine that suddenly from the word, he starts to feel the anger of God. And how can a man who bears the anger of God for a nation not, send, not seems to feel as if God is even angry with him? Got the point? How can you bear the anger of God for a people, for a nation, and yet not feel and sense that God is even angry with you? Do you know why the prophets all begin to understand? that That's why it's so costly for these men to stand in the place of the office of a prophet. So they were not exempted. It's not like, you know, he stands up, he feels the anger of God, and he gets up in a congregation one day and says, oh, you know what? God is angry with you. And they ask, how do you know? I can feel his anger. He's angry with you. By the time when he stands up and tells of the anger of God, it is almost as if he is part of that candidate. He's part of the people in which God is angry with. You got the point there? So actually, God is not angry with prophet with, with Jeremiah. He's not sending judgment per se on this particular man, but he was to bear the anguish of that word. And in so doing, it makes him feel as if that God was angry with him. Saints, if you understand this, right now what I'm saying, this is the division. This is the line drawn between two pastors and two preachers of our time. You know how much of our preaching today is about? It's just about. But it's not it. It's informational. It's not personal. This is personal. This has been made a part of him. It's in him. That anguish, this, this, this whole sense of the Lord's anger is even within him. And this is what was terrible. This must be difficult. That's why he... he <laughs> That's why these men didn't wish to live. Do you know that in the in the long along the way, these prophets all wish to die? They want to live. It was too much. So I'm just kind of sharing this here with you that uh wow. That was what that was the that was the level, that was the cause, that was the price that they have to pay. So they felt, Jeremiah felt 
that word before it could be declared became a personal thing, became an inward thing for them. For the burning anger of Yahweh has not turned back from us. I'm going to go down now. Moving further into this same chapter. And then he says in verse 19, then he continues, he's, he's, he's not spare. All right, if you were to read the remaining verses from verse uh, 9 onwards all the way down, uh, it continues. But I'm, I'm taking you now uh, into verse 19. Okay. Now there's another break here. As he continued to speak, again, he, he paused, and the part that is him comes out again. As we saw in verse 8, we see it now here in verse 19. And verse 19 is really specific. It's really detailed. This is, this is really opening up his own soul. Verse, verse 19 is, is, I think, is at the very beginning, the crux of it all. I believe that this was so early part of the prophecies or the writings of Jeremiah because I think this was to be the indicator for all of his days to come. But I think God, in his wisdom, allowed Jeremiah to expose this or to open this up. And, uh, and that's why in my, in my reading of the prophets, I always use a particular color to highlight the portion where it is just the prophet himself. I like that. <laughs> Try doing that, all right? So sometimes when you're reading it, when, when can you spot it is, it is the prophet talking? This, this is no longer just about what God is speaking to the nation of Israel and to Judah and all of the details of what he was going to do. Suddenly, there is the moment when the prophet himself starts to surface the heart, the cry, the vulnerability, the humane, the human part of the man. And that to me, it's precious. Why? Because, because that's, that's an indication of where we are. Because this is what's going to happen when God put his words into you. And I have, I have, I've always, uh, if there was any struggle as a minister of the gospel, as a pastor, as a servant of the Lord, some of you who are sitting here who have known me for, for so long in the ministry will know that if there's any anguish I've ever carried is this, when is it that when I preach or what I preach has become, or those that have sat in the ministry for so long, when have they sat under the ministry of the word for so long and yet not, and yet not see the manifestation and the outworking of that word? That we listen to the word for so long and yet, what has the word become in us? What has the word turned in us? What has the word taken root in us? What has the word become in us? We've listened to so much. We've listened to so many. We've given ourselves to so much of preaching and the word spoken to us. What has it done? What has been its outcome? What has come out of that deposit of the word in us? And that has always been my prayer. I say, Lord, make it personal to them. Make it real for them. It's not as if that, you know, people like us walk away and, and say that, you know, Lord, we need some encouragement. At least, you know, uh, give me some encouragement and see that, you know, whatever I've been preaching is starting to show fruit. <laughs> and uh, so I've been gently reminded by Adriel that he has been spending time with these young dear brothers here and said that, you know, that they sat in the church when they were all babies and kids. <laughs> and uh, look at them today, you know. They were sitting there, not as if they were making fantastic response all through the years, but now suddenly in their adulthood, uh, we're seeing the manifestation of that word. We're seeing what the word have done in their heart, in their soul, in silence, in quietness, you know, in the things in which they have gone through themselves in the days. So, so this, and in a very small way, this is this is the cry of any one of us who are truly, you know, servants of the Lord. Don't we long for that? So here you are, another caption, another kind of 
an escape of the heart and soul of the prophet himself. My soul, here you are, I'm reading now verse 19. My soul, my soul. <laughs> I think the word there is the word mess. Uh, Messa, the Jewish word there is Messa, Messa. My soul, my soul. Can you imagine it's coming out. It's within him now. What? Why would? Why would a? Why would a man be saying those things? This is not a family crisis. This is not a financial crisis. This is not about him. You know, being disappointed over some big plans of his and it didn't work out. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, when he's writing the prophecy, you know, he kind of put his emotional down. His, his, his emotional state down. No, it's not. It's part of the response, the continuity of what that word has become in him. And now it has become so detailed, so sp specific. He says that my soul, my soul, the word soul there is the word, my inward part. The original Hebrew word for the word soul there is my inward part. My inward part, my inward part. I am in anguish. My inward part. It is in anguish. So you see, they were not allowed to detach. Their, their, their entire being, their inward state, was not allowed to be detached from what they were about to proclaim. They are not peons. They are not clerks. Things. They are not, they are not telephonists. Got the point there? They are not, they are not, the, they are not, the, they are not your delivery boy. They don't come away and come before you. You know what? My master said this to you and told you to listen. And, and he lists out all of the things in which he demands from you. And then he said, okay, that's all that. I've done my duty. It's for you now to fulfill your duty and follow the word of my master. And then he walks away. You understand what I'm saying? So it's not like that. So there is a involvement. There is a diving in. There is a plunging. There is a union. There is a cohesion. There is a blend. There is a coming together. There is a union. There is a blending. That the word, when it comes into the prophet, it becomes a part of him. It costs him something. Something happens within them. My soul, my soul, he said, he said, I'm in anguish. That is exactly what Paul is saying. That for so long, for centuries, these people in Jerusalem have been reading, have been reading Sabbath after Sabbath, the voices of the prophet. But you know what? They missed the voices of the prophet. This is what it means. The voices of the prophet refers to this. It's not just words. And for Jews, they were just words that they were reading. And that's exactly what can happen to even the modern church of our time. It's words. Discipleship is words. Follow our program. It's words. Program. It's words. Preaching sometimes. It's informational. Inspirational. It's words. It's information. I like it. I'm delighted with it. I'm inspired with it. I clap my hands and I feel good. I have a good Sunday lunch. I came to church and you know what? I got inspired. Oh, this is good for my mind. This is good for my Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. But this was a word that was not to have that kind of a result. This was the word that's going to have my soul, my soul. I'm in anguish. Oh, my heart. My heart is pounding in me. I cannot be silent. Can you imagine? Here's a man saying, I cannot be silent. What, did, what happened earlier when he was called? God, I'm not good with words. <laughs> and now he cannot be silent. Saints, you know something when the word really operates? It takes you right out of your original of, of your original state of the very person that you are. The word, the word de-recognize yourself. And that's when you know that you've been called. That's when you know that what you carry is not of your own. That's when you know that what you say didn't come from you. I know this. I know this when I stand up in a poor in Rwanda. 
in Mongolia. I know this when I'm in the hills of India. I know this. I walk away in nights, you know, in tears in my bedroom, and I know it. I know it. I know it in my anguish. I know it in my private times. I know it with my hands on my face in the toilet. I know it because I didn't say that. It didn't come from me. But yet it's so part of me. I cannot be silent. Yes, man. I don't know how to talk, God. Don't call me. And then he says, because you have heard Oh, my soul, I want to read to you from the literal, uh, the literal way of him saying that in English and everything is transliteration, meaning in the literal way. I don't know how it sounds like in the Hebrew at the time when he spoke it. All right, this is a transliteration in English, which is actually literally what he actually say. It's at the psych of the corner of my Bible. This is what he say, I... My soul hurt. I, my, I, my soul hurt. I don't know how you can put this. Can you understand this? I, my soul hurt. I, my soul hurt. You know, for a long time, so many of us would spend time and say, did the Lord ever spoke to us? Yes, I heard the Lord gave me a word. I heard the Lord. The Lord said this. The Lord said that. The Lord told me this 20 years ago. The Lord said to me 10 years ago, you know, the eye can have a lot of these kind of uh, repetition. I, you know, I heard. Lord, I, I went to a conference, I went to a camp, I went to a seminar, and the Lord spoke to me about my this and that and the other. And the Lord spoke, I. Yeah, there's, there's a part called the I that, that is engaged in the listening or in the hearing. I just used the word just now. Basically, we spend so much of our time in the things of the Lord, just hearing and listening. I heard the message, I heard the conference, I heard the seminar, I heard what he said, I heard that in the school, I heard that in this and that in the I, 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 I heard that. But there's there's a part here that I want, that Jeremiah is exposing to us, which I think is, the this, this is what composed what Paul said, he says, the voices of the prophet, that you read the prophet, but you have missed the voices of the prophet. Any more that you miss the Messiah, you have also missed the voices of the prophet. And I'll tell you, when I was reading this again, it struck me that I've spent so many years reading the prophets. I'm just using the prophets. Lord, have I missed the voices of your prophet? Have I, as a man, an individual, a saint, a child of God, a redeemed person, miss any of the voices of the prophet. I'm with the prophets again, saints. I, I, my soul hurt. Now there's a part here that goes beyond just, oh, I heard this. Oh, I heard that. Yeah, I thought the Lord spoke. Yeah, that was a good message. Oh, that was a good Sunday. Oh, that was a good seminar. Oh, that was a good conference. But it's, he says this in the original, I, my soul hurt. Earlier he said, he said, my soul, my soul is an anguish. This is a different, this is a different hearing. This is a different sound. This is a different thing here. This is where the organic is. This is where the dynamic is. This is where the power is. This is where the reality is. What happened is the word has gone into the inward part. The word has gone into a whole different dimension, a whole different operation, a whole different process here. There's a whole different facet here. This is a soul. It's in the inward part. The part, listen, saints, the part that you and I could read earlier here in verse 8 that says, I girt myself with sackcloth. The part that finally gets you into action. 
the part that gets you to act. You know, so much of our hearing today, don't act. There's no action in it. There's no acting. There's no doing. There's no acting. There's no act in it. I girt myself with sackcloth. It affected me so deeply. I acted. I acted. <laughs> I always remember what Oswald Chamber one time wrote. He says that so many of us are so ready, but we never go. Ever heard of the statement that says, I'm so ready, but we never go. We say we're ready. Yes, Lord, I'm ready. All of our hypes are all there, but we don't go. We hear so much of it. But here he says, I girt myself with sackcloth. So something came out. It turned into action. It turned into a sense of the performing. There's a performance of that word. There's an acting out of that word. He says that I lament and I veil. Ah. There's something about the lamenting. There's something of the emotion, something of the affection, something of that lamenting. You know, you think of it, isn't it? Why would, why would an entire book be devoted to, the, to, to call lamentations? Who wants to record? Who wants to record lamentations? Eh? Who wants to record lamentations? Where did they put the obituary in newspaper? You should put it in a very far corner, isn't it? You have to look out who passed on and what happened. Who wants to read lamentation? Negative. Dreadful. And yet, and yet this is God's permission that God will allow this man, Jeremiah, to write an entire piece called the lamentation after the prophecies here in Jeremiah. So this is something beyond my soul, my soul. So actually, what I'm trying to get across here, or what Jeremiah is saying is, I can hear, I can listen, I can buy MP3s, I can use a Walkman, I can hear this in my car, I, I can do all of this, but have my soul hurt. Israel has been reading the prophets for centuries, and yet they miss the voices of the prophet. What is it that, what is in that statement that says they miss the voices of the prophet? They're so, they're so, they're so never heard. Their ears hurt, their heads hurt, but their soul never heard. Never entered into the soul. Never came into the inward parts. Can I give you an example here which struck me? I preached it so long. Never saw the context until, until now. You ready for this? I read it. Some of you heard me preach. I know that I, when I was in the Borneo school, I, 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 I used this text so often. Never understood it in the way, I think it's because in the like of this, I came to see this. This is at the beginning of chapter 4, and this is Israel. This is Jeremiah pleading with Israel, God pleading with Israel that the judgment is coming. But then he say, if you will return, that's grace. I always say that judgment is God's grace reaching out. That's what judgment is. It's grace. What is grace? Judgment. You want the grace of God? Judgment. Why? Because that's the only way for you to understand sin. How can grace ever reach you and yet not let you see what sin is? And how can you ever know what sin is unless God begins to deal with you and judge you? That's what grace is. Grace cannot reach you 
in kindness. Grace cannot reach you in, 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 in bubble gum. Grace cannot reach you, you know, in kisses. Grace cannot reach you in all of the sweetness and all of the honey-coated words that people bring to you. Grace cannot reach you like that. If grace comes to you like that, that's not grace. That's a disguise. That's falsehood. That's lying to you. It's cheating you. It's denying you. It's defaulting you from the truth. If grace reaches you, grace reaches you with judgment. Why? Because only judgment can arouse in you the issue of sin in your life. Because without, without your knowledge of sin, you never come to God. You never turn to God. You never know how you need to be safe and need to be redeemed. You never know that you need the blood to cleanse you. You never know that you need to be redeemed by God. You never know that you need to have a change. You never know what it means to repent. So when grace reaches you or when judgment touches the fringes of your life, it's the grace of God. So here is the grace manifested here at the beginning of chapter 4. If you will return, O Israel, verse 1 itself. And then it goes all the way down. I wish we could just go verse by verse here. The richness of it all, the words that that that. Jeremiah engaged in the, 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 oh, saying the volume of it, the content of those things that came out from the words of the mouth of Jeremiah. And then here, this is what I want to show to you here. For thus says Yahweh in verse 3, I'm reading from verse 3, for thus say Yahweh to the men of Judah and to Jerusalem, this is what I meant when I said, I've been preaching for this for a long, long time. Never understood the context. Never make the connection. I read it. I preach from it. I don't think I preach any error out of it through the years. But I never make the connection until today. And here, here it says, break up your fellow ground. It's all a matter of metaphor here. So here is God using and employing metaphors. It's a matter of speaking or manner of speaking. All right. So it doesn't mean that really they need to break up. But God is using this as an example to bring out something to the nation of Israel. He says, break up your fallow ground and do not sow among thorns. You know what fallow grounds is, isn't it? Grounds that has been once cultivated before, but it has been left empty, you know, all fallow, untouched, you know, unattended to. And so God said, well, it's like you, you, it, so he's using the ground. Well, go back now. Into the ground. He said, break up now. The fellow starts sowing. So this is his way of saying, just when I read, break up your fellow grounds, he did this. Break up your fellow grounds and do not sow among thorns. Now, as I said, it's all example. So you, you can almost tell, isn't it, when God starts to talk like that, break up your fellow grounds and don't sow among thorns. What do you think he's talking? He's starting to talk about, he's starting to put finger into things that is on the inside, isn't it? He's not really talking about grounds. He's not really talking about sowing and harvesting of the earth. He's talking about the earth's spiritual state. He said, start now to dig, start to do something with those grounds. So he says, break up the fallow ground, because why? It's time to sow. So do not sow among thorns. Okay, that's one example. And then he want, went on to say, circumcise yourself to Yahweh. I, you, of course, you have read that before. And remove the four skins of your heart. This is the second metaphor. So the first metaphor was breaking up the fallow ground. And the second metaphor is circumcising your own heart. Now, you notice the, the indication here, the instruction is you circumcise your own heart. In other words, you make up your mind. There's something in which you need to do. So circumcise the very, you circumcise yourself to Yahweh and remove the foreskin of your heart. So here you are. Suddenly there's two very distinct metaphor, one east, one west. No connection whatsoever, isn't it? Tilling the ground or breaking the fallow ground and then circumcising your heart. And then it struck me in a 
it immediately struck me when I was dealing with this, when I was reading what Paul said to those men and women there in 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 in, in uh, by Sidon, uh, Antioch, that they were not listening to the voices of the prophet. Listen, what, what do you think God is doing here? Fellow ground, circumcising your heart. What do you, you what do you think God is saying here? What he's actually saying is. The very ground of everything in your life is your heart. The very ground of everything in your life is your heart. The very ground, the very foundation, the very base of everything in your life is your heart. And that, he says, is where you got wrong. And that's where you got, you got lost. That's where you got darkened. That's where you got corrupted. That's where you got deserted. That's where you went wayward. Your heart, your heart is the ground of everything. It's the ground of your relationship with me. It's the ground of what I have been speaking to you. So, so in the context here of what Jeremiah, can you imagine when Jeremiah put this out to the nation of Israel? It's for Israel. I said to you, how can you announce a word to Israel and yet not feel that you are part of it? You bear God's anger for a people and yet you will not be spared that God is angry with you too. Saints, if I stand here and keep having to keep telling the nation about God's anger, before long, if I'm detached from that pronouncement soon, I'll be arrogant. If I stand detached from what I pronounce about the anger of God for a people, and I'm detached from that anger, before long, if I'm still the instrument, I will soon be given to pride. Yes or no? You'll be feeling as if you are one. You're more righteous than them. You're, you're a little bit better. And God will not spare you from that. He will not spare me from that. How can God ever have you to be the instrument to pronounce anything and yet not make you feel that you're part of that? Because that will be your safety. That will be your own salvation. It's not the salvation only of a nation. It's your own salvation. And I want that. I want that. I want to walk away from a meeting feeling that what I said to Sri Lanka, what I said to Nepal, what I said to those pastors, I want to bear the anguish of that thing for my own life. I want to walk away in the flight home and feeling depressed and feeling as if there's something hit me on the head. I want that because, you know, I'm constantly reminded that what I preach and what came out of me, saints, it's going to cost me too. Because why? Because it speaks to the same condition that is in me, of which I may not know is already in me. As much as it's already in those audience and audiences that were listening to us. Can you can you un, can you grasp the phenomenon of this of this dynamic here? Isn't it wonderful today? You know why today there is so few prophetic voices in the nations of the earth? I'm not talking about self-made prophets. I'm not, I'm not talking about all of these elevated self-made, self-proclaimed prophets. I'm not talking about things like that. Why is it the church is so is has waited so long and it'd be so hard to receive a prophetic word? You know, I was I was just looking at a book that says, you know, PT Forsai, you know, the prophet of our time. Goodness gracious, this is written somewhere in the in in the in the let me see. 70 years after his death, 70, 80 years after his death. Now, you say he was a prophetic voice to the church of Jesus Christ, you know, in his nation and in, in the nearby nations, but he did and gone. So it tells you, isn't it, while he was alive, while he was proclaiming, while he was writing, while he was preaching, while he was teaching, while he was pastoring. They didn't recognize that. Why? Because the church was never ready. Like every age of the church is never ready to hear the words of a prophetic insight, of a prophetic call, of a, prof of a prophetic destiny. And I think this is the anguish of men like Art Kets. I asked him one time, which is the last country you want to preach? He 
is America. <laughs> Which is the last country that you want to preach in. If you were to choose all the country, is America. Look at her today. Look at the state of the country. So I, I want you to see this. So he hit me, or it kind of came to me graciously when I was reading this. I think the Lord knows I've been employing this scripture for so long a time. And finally, and it says, it's almost as if God said that, you know, he puts it right there. And, you know, your eye has been blinded. It has been shielded. You know, it's like a spiritual cataract over you for, for a long, long time. And you're a preacher and you look at it. And then finally he hit you and they say, oh. Why didn't I see it 30 years ago? You're not ready. Why didn't I when I see when that why didn't I see this 20 years ago? You're not ready yet. The circumstances has not prepared you. Your heart is not in the place to see this. See, it's always the issue of the heart. The heart. This I wrote here, and where the ground, where the ground is the heart. So I think Jeremiah amplified this preciously, gloriously, so personally. I, my soul, hurt. Yes, I hear this. I hear. I listen. I listen. I hear. It's all physical. It's audio. And that is endless of this exercise. I hear, I hear. Israel has been hearing. The prophets has been read Sunday after Sunday, Sabbath after Sabbath. I hear, but they miss the voices of the prophet. Where is it found? So saints, unless something within our soul come into a dimension of this, how is it for you and I to ever hear the voices not only the prophets, how would you and I ever hear the voice of Jesus Christ? The voice of the Spirit. The voice of the apostles. The voice of the New Testament. So he says, my soul, my soul, I'm in anguish. Oh, my heart. My heart is pounding in me. This is, this is not a heart attack. This is not doing some physical exercise. So it's just pounding. Remember another time he said, he said that your word is like fire in my bones. I don't know how these prophets lived. I don't know. I don't think that I, there's no mention that these prophets were single. That means they were married. I don't know what their marriage was like. In modern terms here, saints, I, I I used to wonder, this is one of the things that I like to talk about. I mean, one of the things I want to ask them when I do see them in glory one day. How was your marriage like? <laughs> you live in a man like that, in that state of emotion. How was his marriage like? I know that their marriages are not in the circumstances that we have in modern days and times and, and all kinds of, you know, pressure and all kinds of, uh, you know, social structures, you know, but Boy, having to live with a man like that. Can you imagine my heart is pounding, you know, in me. And your wife comes near to you. Uh, you forgot to buy the Ikan Blisa. <laughs> my heart is pounding in me. You're telling me to go and buy Ikan Blisa. <laughs> I'm just giving you an example. <laughs> Uh, I cannot be silenced because you have heard, oh, my soul. I, my soul, have heard the sound of the trumpet, the shout of war. Destruction upon destruction is called out for the whole land is devastated. Can you imagine? These were things 
that is yet to come. Saints, they were not immediate in front of him. It's like as if the moment he opened his eyes and it's happening. This is in the future. But here's a demonstration of the power of a given word at the present time because it translates the future into the present. And that's exactly what the church is supposed to be. That every word that we hear is a word of the future is as good as a word in the present. Why isn't all of our future word translated into the present? Why isn't it a word that is the present here and then? And therefore, accord it with a present response. And because it is so future, we give it a futuristic approach and a futuristic response. Oh, Jesus is coming. Oh, okay, there's the end time. Oh, the kingdom is going to come. You know, you understand? It's all a matter of speech. It's a matter of saying. It's a matter of theology. It's a matter of doctrine. But where is the present? It can only be present when it has attended your soul. It has been, it found its resident in your soul. It found a dwelling place in your soul. It found a living space in your soul. It found a center in your soul. In fact, it's the only center. This is where it regulates everything there is within our soul. By the way, just to let you know that, that should tell you why our soul has a chance to come into all of its healing when a word of this nature enters into our soul, when our soul will truly, and the need of our soul will truly be met. So many of our soul problems, of our behavioral problems, and all of our idiosyncrasies that comes from our soul, sayings have not been attended because the word has not had its depth, nor its work in us. And that's why so many of the area of our soul remain unattended, and so much of our behavior and the conditions of our soul find all of its uh, peripherals and all of its tendrils all over the place because the soul have not had it's original, what it should have for its very life and sustenance. And what is that? Is the word spoken in there? Is the word residing in there? So let me finish this up here. Destruction upon destruction is called out for the whole land is devastated. And suddenly my tents are devastated. Can you imagine? I told you, didn't I? He, he was not exempted when he saw that judgment coming. When the tents, when destructions and all of the devastation came, suddenly it became so personal. Suddenly he said, suddenly my tents are devastated. My curtains in an instant. In other words, when that comes, he notices and he recognizes that even his own tent and his own curtains will be destroyed. Easy when you stand in a place to be only an announcer and only a messenger because you're telling they that their tent and their curtains will all be devastated and destroyed. But when you stand today with the word that comes into your life. And when you begin to even translate that word or announce that word, you know that you yourself is not spared. Even your curtains and your tents will not be spared. Now that is a different way of speaking. It's not just them. It's all of us now. Even my tent and my curtains will not be spared. They will be devastated. Got the point there? Any more than Elijah? Remember? Elijah pronounced to Israel, he said that for three days, for three years, no rain. Isn't it? No rain. No food. That means, no rain means, in other words, all of your, all of your produce will be in trouble. All your lands will be in, in, uh, uh, in devastation. You'll be in famine. Folks listening in the end, or hiding there by the brook and chariot there, who gave him food? Raven, which means he pronounced a prophetic word that in the end caused even his own dwelling, even his own personal livelihood. 
easy to give a word that doesn't cost you anything. But when you give a word that in the end even entails your personal losses, your personal sacrifice, your personal suffering, that is a whole different matter. And he has, to, he has to be hiding by the water broke there and being fed by ravens. Because why? The very pronouncement he gave to the nation, in the end, he suffers it. So then he finally says, his cry was in verse 21, how long must I see the standard? See, again, a little bit of it of himself comes out. How long must I see the standard? and hear the sound of the prophet. Even God allowed him to be in anguish. Even God allowed him to be discouraged. God allowed him to even ask questions. Why not? He's human. Lord, how long? How long must I see the standard? Lord, I've been in this shape. I've been in this for so long. How long, Lord? How long must I keep seeing the standard? How long? And hear the sound of the trumpet. In other words, you know, what is there some respite? Is there some ease? Is there some... <sighs> He's allowed to do that. And that's what makes these prophets so precious. The writings of these prophets so enduring, so timeless. <laughs> Got the point now? And what the church has lost in our time today and not having to cherish the voices of the prophets. We have no understanding of the voices of the prophets. Do you understand now why? That the modern church of our time have lost so much just by this, just what I'm just sharing like this. Look at the gem. Look at the treasure that just came out in an hour like this. It came out from the prophets, and yet we don't want to read the prophets. It's called bloom and doom. It's all judgment and death and devastation. Enough, please. I'm with Jesus now. I'm in a New Testament. I'm in a new creation. Everything is all brand new. Everything is all nice and fine and happy, clappy. Let's sail the boat and let's go to the everlasting land. Why do this? Well, I'll tell you what, you can thrive on those things that I just said, but you don't have a ground. I told you, your ground is the heart. You find yourself in some point at the crisis of your life, in the times and the seasons of your trial and the tests and the tribulations of your life. You find yourself not having a ground anymore. Why? Because it takes the heart for God to plow. It takes God to follow it. It takes the breaking of the fallow. It takes the circumcision of your heart to find grounds so that you will survive. The crisis. Well, you survive the test. You survive those collision. You survive those moral despair and those moral collisions of your life, which is tragic sometimes. You live through those days of your life in the foundation that you don't even know how much is required if it's not that God has done its work in those times of preparation. So that's why we need the prophets, saints. So how beautiful, how right for Paul to correlate between not recognizing the Messiah by the Jewish people, and yet they would have the audacity and they would have the constancy of reading the words of the prophets, Sabbath after Sabbath. And Paul cried out in the synagogue, he said, for they have missed and they have not recognized either, he said, the voices of the prophets. So you can read the prophets and yet miss the voices of the prophet. You can read the Bible and yet misses the voices of the Spirit. You can read you can hear messages, and yet you can miss the very voices of Jesus Christ or the voice of Jesus Christ. So it's a, it's a cautionary word here this morning for all of our hearts. Isn't it rich? Can you see the expense? Can you see the marvel of it all? And uh, no one told me in the early years growing up how 
vital the writings of the prophets are. I just know it in the years of just reading the prophets that I remember what one year into my salvation, I just I just I just love reading the prophets. I don't understand it. I was barely 18 years old then. I remember I was reading, you know, Jeremiah, Isaiah. Oh, you, I used to wonder, there's so much in there. But somehow I know enough to know then, as a young kid, this is important. Somehow this has got everything to do with not only my present life, but my future life. It cannot be here by accident. I don't know them. I was so young then. You know, only to find out 50 years later, I'm still in it. And guess what? It's still missing it. Not seeing it the way I should. I suppose if I live another 50 years, there will still be things in here that I'm still missing. And I'm glad I'm missing it. That shows that it's not because you're clever. It's not because you have all this up in your head and it's all, you know, all up in your sleeve. You know exactly what to do. You've got everything all prepared, you know, all in sequence. No, you don't. It's going to surprise you. And I'm so thankful this morning for such a, you know, for such a wisdom, for such a prophetic, you know, incursion uh, of this nature into us. The voices of the prophet. And uh, so regardless, sometimes when a man or a woman sit in the church, blah, 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 I've been listening, you know, to so-and-so, listening uh, to such a great preacher. For how long have you been there? I've been there for 25 years, you know. And, and sometimes, you know, just by the duration of that, that seems to be usually our our approaches you know that used to be the the, the the measure of the spirituality the standard wow that means you, you must be quite a guy <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so i think the true measure of truly a man or a woman regardless of whether he hears it from a great preacher or he hears it in a sunday school it isn't that oh i heard or rather he had heard. He did hear. Thank God. It has to begin with the eye. I heard the word preach. I heard the word read. Now, I heard the word from a tape, from a CD, from a download, whatever. But he said, my soul heard. And sometimes, sorry for this, but sometimes the, between, between this and this, I can't tell the time. Sometimes what you've just heard, you thought you heard, but never entered in your soul, never broke into the vastness of what, is, what, it, what it meant for your soul and the turning and the churning within the state of your soul until it's 20 years later. I can't tell. None of us can tell. The interspace between this, from this one, uh, from this one point to the next point, from this one sphere to the next sphere, I can't tell. I wish I can. I wish preachers can have a word preach and on an, in an instant it could happen. It can happen. It happened. It happened to John Wesley sitting in a meeting one night, you know, in the in the tinkle in the in the in the fading of those candle lights, and the word was preached, and he heard it, and that was it. That was the night. That was the evening he went home, the transaction, and the whole immersing of that word into the soul of that man. And that's what in the end made him to be that man for the nation of England and the world at large and the church all over the nations. It can happen. But sometimes there is to be a transitioning from what I just hear and into what my soul heard. And only God can give to us that transition. And if you and I today hear this, we may kind of poise ourselves and position ourselves to say, Lord, this is my prayer. I know that this will be your prayer. Lord, make it. Make it to be one day soon that my soul hear this. Lord, let my soul hear this. I know what they're saying. I know what everyone is saying. But Lord, let my soul hear this. I don't care. I abandon all of what it takes, what it costs in the future. Lord, I don't bother because if it is of you and from you, it's safe. 
And what I have to pass through, it's in your good hands. Amen. You will take me through it. The same word that proceeded from you will be the same word that will guard me and save me to the end. But for now, Lord, bring it into my soul. Whatever it takes, let it be in my soul. Let me hear it deep within me, in the inward part of me. In fact, every part of me on the inside. Let me hear this. Let it shape me, form me, make me. Lord, break me up. Form me, shape me, bring me into all of his integrated form. Bring me there so that I will never miss your voice, nor the voices of the prophets, nor the voice of your spirit. Lord, thank you that you would keep secrets for us and the secrets of the Lord are with those who fear you. And if we fear you, you share with us the secrets of your heart. Thank you for the secrets of, Lord, your redemption. Secrets of all of the voices of the prophets, the ways of the prophets. Because you were the one that called these men. You were in the very history of all of these men as much as you were in the history of your own people, Israel. Thank you so much today. We stand here at the brim of a New Testament people to know the Lord. We inherit those blessings. We inherit these promises. We inherit these riches that is so richly granted unto us. Not that we deserve it, but because by what you give to us, we freely receive it. We thank you. We bless you, my God. Let Israel again hear the voices of the prophets. Let your law that is read in the synagogues of the nations, Lord, let Jews hear the voices of the prophets. Let the church of Jesus Christ again hear the voices of the prophets. Let our pastors and our shepherd hear the voices of the prophets. Let us hear again the voices of the prophets. Because in so doing, Lord, we will be open to your voice. In fact, the voices of the prophet is the voice of Jesus himself. It's the voice of the Spirit is the voice of the Father. So win us, bring us to yourself. Thank you again, Lord, for opening yourself to us, your heart and your counsel to us this day. We receive it in joy and with thanksgiving. My God, see to it that this word will have its effect in all of our lives. And those who are even online listening to this, thank you. And for this, we bless you and we worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand, shall we? Praise God. And uh, would you, maybe? As we partake the Lord's uh, cup and body. Thank you, Lord. Could you have uh, Joshua to come and pray uh, for the communion for us, Josh? Could you come? I think this is on too. Really. Thanks, Josh. All right, as we hold uh, the emblems together in our hands, uh, how wonderful is this moment that uh, this is the bread and this is the wine that we eat and drink, which is the word. Jesus is the eternal word of which we eat and drink into our lives. Thank you. Joshua, as you pray for us. Lord, we give thanks to you for, for such a word, such a time as this, oh God, with all the things that's been going on in this nation, in the nations of the world, in Israel even, Lord, yes. how much more we need to hear a word that is not that's beyond the superficial, a word Lord, that will sink and yes. eat the very soul of our hearts, Amen. the very ground of our heart, oh God. Yes. Lord, forgive us, Lord, for all the seasons we have missed, all the seasons and opportunities, oh God, where we have sat in the church, we have heard the word of oh God, and yet our soul have not listened, our soul have not heard, yeah. our soul has not been dealt with, oh God. Lord, forgive us, oh God, for we have allowed 
our grounds to remain fallow. Mm. We have remained our hearts true. to remain uncircumcised, O oh God. It's true. Lord, we have not had the appetite, we have not had the desire, O oh God, for your word to reach deep into our hearts, for your judgment to penetrate our very soul, O oh God. Yeah. Lord, we, we, we would rather have the comfort, we would rather have the safety, mm. we would rather live lives that are private, O oh God. Yeah. yeah. It's not in communion with you and also with one another, O oh Father, Lord. So, Lord, we ask, Lord, for our church, for the churches in nations, yeah. the churches in Malaysia, yeah. and all the, all the lives, oh God, that, that we are connected to, Lord. Right. Will you spare? Will you keep your people? Will you, will you, will we, be, will we hear, oh God? Will we truly hear? Let these things be real in us. Let That's these true. things be, be, yeah. be manifested. Let these things be, Worked out, O oh God, as you have called for us to work yeah, out our salvation. That's right. yep. God, how great indeed is your salvation, O oh God, that will send your son to die on the cross, Lord. Yes. Lord, that we can now have this relationship, we can now have this communion, Lord, intimate communion it's with true. the Father, Lord. Yes. So, Lord, make these things right. Whatever it takes, O oh God, let these things be right. If it, if it would take judgment to come, it would right. take anything to come, O oh God, let it come. Quicken this work in us, O oh God. Yes. Lord, mature us that we will attain this. Mature us, O oh God, that the church will attain this, O oh Father, Lord. Lord, and if we can set this right with you, O oh God, we right. can also be, have communion. We can also be united, Lord God, as brothers and sisters in the True. faith, O oh God, because right. this is what holds us. This is the mm. foundation, O oh God, yeah. of every part of our lives. Yeah. So, Lord, confirm these things. Lord, as we partake of this bread and the cup, O oh God, we acknowledge, we remember you, O oh God, Amen. and we confirm and, and desire and want that these things yeah. to be planted in deep in us on fertile ground. Seal this in us. Seal this in Amen. our hearts, O oh God. Amen. Not because, Bless not because of anything we can, because we don't choose you. We do not want you, O oh God, but because of right. the work you have done in our lives, O oh God, yeah. that these things can be real. That Christ in us, O oh God, the hope of glory. Lord, we give thanks to you and Thank pray you. all this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And together as a body and as a people, for those who are online, if you have the emblems in your hands, Lord, we partake of your life, your body, and your blood. My God, we thank you that he that drinketh and eateth me, the same dwelleth in me and I in him. And this we obey and we do in obedience. Let's eat and drink together. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. One more time. My hope is built on nothing else than Jesus' blood and the righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but the holy lead on Jesus' name on Christ the solid rock I stand oh other ground a sinking sand oh other ground a Sinking sand on Christ the solid rock I stand. Oh, other ground is sinking sand. Oh, other ground is sinking sand. Lord, build your church through the lives of men like Simon, Lawrence, Mark. Build your church through body, suit, and those saints. Build your people in the nations. We thank you. You love her, and you will love her to the end. 
We thank you for your people. So, Lord, this morning we close by saying that, Lord, the same love that you put in us is the same love that we have loved others, our neighbors, the unlovable, the loveless, to love the nations, to love the Rwandans, to love the Ugandans, the Kenyans, the Burundians, the Nepali, the Yanmaris, the Vietnamese, the Filipinos, the Singaporeans, whoever that you will put within our path and our hearts and our life. Thank you again. Thank you for staying us, your staying power. Thank you that we, you who are biking us, we are biking you. My God, we thank you. Watch this word. Let it take its shape and form into all of our hearts and life. Prepare us. Prepare for those that will come for the conference near and far. Prem from the poor, dear brother. Thank you, my provide for all of them. Journey is far for so many, for Sud and the family from New Zealand, from Olambata. So, my God, we thank you for those who will come. Oh, has confirmed coming, and those that will come, you draw their path, their feet, and bring them unto us, and they to yourself. For this, we give you praise and we give you thanks as you continue to watch over us, Lord, and allow your word to take shape and form, and that our soul may hear it again. For this, we bless you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.